this panel is one that's near and dear to my heart because it's talking about the place where the rubber really meets the road in diversity and inclusion. And as those of you who were here uh, earlier when Mary Snap and I talked, uh, we illustrated the point that a lot of organizations that do a decent job with bringing in diverse slates of talent are still challenged with how to retain them and how to provide opportunities for growth and development and advancement to leadership roles. And that's a good segue to this panel because uh, the common denominator among the people on this panel is that they not only take a very active and hands-on role with diversity and inclusion in their respective shops, but they themselves are in positions uh, of leadership. Uh, and so I will just briefly introduce them and tell you a little bit about uh, what they do. Catherine Adkins is the Group Vice President, General Counsel and Secretary at Toyota Financial Services. Toyota is uh, one of those gold standard companies in diversity and inclusion. Um, my good friend Sandra Phillips just recently became the General Counsel. She's an African-American female of Toyota uh, North America. Uh, and of course, most of you know that Chris Reynolds, who was in that role, recently became the General Counsel of Toyota Motor Corp. Right, which is in like Japan. In Japan, big Toyota, and he's an African-American male, which I think speaks volumes about that company uh, and what it is focused on. Jeremy Roth is, one of the, is the co-chairman of the entire firm of Littler Mendelssohn. Littler is, uh, as everyone knows, uh, the firm, one of the firms, I would say. No, the is better. The is, the is better. <laughs> Uh, in its space. I got to know the firm very well when I was at Walmart. They did uh, a huge chunk of, of the company's work. Um, we, we had such a challenge getting all of us together to have our prep calls that the only time I could have my individual prep call with Jeremy was uh, at a 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And when I was calling his number, I realized it was a San Diego area code. And I immediately apologized for calling him so early. And he said, it's okay, I'm in Costa Rica. So <laughs> all the sympathy I had for him just went out of the window right away. Brian Wong is not only a partner uh, at Pillsbury, he's the head of the corporate and securities group and partner in charge of diversity. Been at the firm for 19 years and actually took a two year break during that go 10 years yeah. to go in house with a company called Organic Inc. Uh, and contrary to the way the name sounds, it has nothing to do with food. It nothing is a digital all. platform digital. company, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, and with that, we will talk about uh, some of the practices that these individuals, these leaders and their respective companies uh, and firms have implemented that they found to be helpful and hopefully that you can sort of replicate in your own respective shops. Before we do that, Jeremy, I want you to sort of start us off with a uh, conversation that just organically began when we were preparing for this panel, um, when I was complimenting them not only for being uh, very focused and committed on diversity and inclusion, but leaders and the sort of tone at the top that you have to have if you're serious or if you're signaling internally and externally that you're serious about this issue. Uh, and Jeremy made an interesting comment. He said it's, it's difficult because the practice of law is challenging right now. Tell me what you meant by that. So in fairness, we have a Costa Rica office, and I had 150 clients there on Friday. Okay. So uh, for those of you who are in outside firms, or even if you're in-house, you get really good spots for your external locations, including Costa Rica, and you have good excuses. So um, <laughs> Nicely done, Jeremy. <laughs> um, the, um, you know, as I said to, to Joe, I mean, and this is stating the obvious, but particularly to a group like this is already tuned in tune with the, the issue. Um, Two things. One is diversity and inclusion efforts don't happen by accident. I mean, it's it's a constant grind out every day to I, I like the last panel uh, to to figure out what is the best practice. I mean, one of the reasons I came up early this morning is I wanted to get my own takeaways from this this group. But let's be clear. I mean, the business the business of legal service providing is a very difficult business. And I think uh, you all know that because you're in it. And those of you who have gone in-house because you didn't like being outside, or those of you who are outside who think, wouldn't it be great to be in-house, or uh, 
moderators for TV talk shows, I'm sure, at one point. It's just a very challenging <laughs> business. And so, you know, when you layer that patina of how difficult our business is to look into the eyes, and of course, I'm only outside, look into the eyes of a young person uh, and say, and by the way, slog it out here for seven or eight or nine years, and then maybe you can get on the bottom rung of this giant ladder, and someday it will be great because you can be like me. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult value proposition if you're talking to uh, not only diverse talent, but you know, any millennial talent, frankly, for that matter. So uh, it, is, it doesn't happen by accident. You really have to start top down and uh, uh, Liz, my good friend Liz, you just have to cram it down the law firm every day. That was the most brilliant thing I've ever said. <laughs> You have to repeat that verbatim. <laughs> um, back row, can There's you no hear him? Light. Okay, okay, yeah. They, I'll show. They, 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 I'm sure they heard you. Um, so I'm wondering because as you were speaking, um, you know, the other law firm guy was nodding vigorously in agreement. I'm wondering from the client standpoint if you agree with that because let's face it, everything in firms is essentially driven by client expectations. Agree or disagree? Uh, with Jeremy's statements about big law and the challenges of being a lawyer in a big law firm? Yes. I, I totally agree. And I think that because the firms are the pipeline feeder to in-house, typically it's rare for an attorney to go in-house directly. Um, the big law firm, even small law firm problems are our, our problems eventually. And so if the firms can't uh, grow talent, it ultimately affects in-house. So even though this isn't directly related to our topic, here's why I wanted to explore it first. Because a lot of the research that we did at MCCA showed that the economic downturn had just a devastating impact on women and minority lawyers. And that diversity and inclusion programs were jettisoned at the slightest sign of trouble. Uh, we heard Mary Snap earlier talk about es establish sort of the business case for diversity and inclusion, the imperative for it, and the reason why it's important to a company like Microsoft and other companies. My question is whether or not we are at a place where companies and firms understand how important it is to retain talent, diverse talent. I can only speak for Toyota, and I would say unequivocally yes. So we swam against that tide, and when other companies were cutting back, we kind of doubled down. That's when we really increased our commitment um, in this area and uh, increased our training in the area, too. Uh, for those of you who don't know Toyota's culture, there's a very deep history of lifetime employment in, Toy in Toyota in Japan, and I air quote that because it's something that's very foreign to us in America, uh, but they really mean it, and so that trickles down to us, and a good example of that is when the economic downturn hit, we did not lay off anybody in any of the plants, even though the plants were idle. And what we did instead was deploy those folks in the community, and there was a lot of community service work. Well, that gets around, and people hear about that, and, and later it's like, oh, I'd like to work at Toyota, right? And at the same time, rather than cutting back on um, DNI training, we increased it so that we had kind of this, this swing um, uh, in terms of the overall commitment in this in this area, and I think the community is paying attention. There are two areas that Toyota is also very active in. One is secondment programs, very, and, and very. employee. I love secondments and ERC employee resource groups <laughs> as well. So let's talk. Yeah, you, you love secondments, but the law firm guys roll their eyes because they say that's how you steal our lawyers. So let's well, talk about. Well, it can be synergistic <laughs> if you're open to it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about those two areas, secondments and your yeah. employee research groups. Yeah, I mean, obviously for us, secondments are, are a goal mine. I know for you all, it, it can be a challenge, but um, we've had to do that recently because uh, the other thing maybe you've read about Toyota is that they are moving the um, headquarters functions from California based to Texas based. And Californians love California, so many of them want to stay in California. And as a result, we've had 
openings that we normally probably wouldn't have had. And so I partnered with some of uh, my firms and had really, really, really outstanding secondments. I can say I'm not stealing them. So there are times when it really works, right? And both of them were millennial women, recent ones were millennial women. And I think they had just an amazing experience. We had just an amazing experience with them. And in terms of deepening the relationships with the firms, let me tell you, that sealed it for me. I, I really genuinely, that's a huge loyalty play. So I love them. And then the, the second- Employee research group, resource groups. Oh, uh, resource groups, we are hugely committed to them and encourage employee involvement to the extent that managers are kind of frowned upon if they're, we call them team members, are um, dissuaded from participating in, in resource or partnering groups. So it's at the management level that we tell them, if somebody comes and wants to do that, as long as they're getting their job done, your job is to help them do it. So over, over to Brian. I want you to talk a little bit about something that I found interesting, uh, and that's the sort of on-ramp program. I think there's a formal name you have for it, for attorneys returning from family leave, which I, I think can be a huge retention tool. Yeah, I mean, and I think Stacy was on the, the last panel and talked about that. We do have two on-ramp fellows at Pillsbury, one in our New York office doing litigation work, and one in my group in San Francisco doing um, doing corporate work and and it's a great way to get talent one of the you know one of the the things we find is we can get really good lateral talent at sort of the the entry level couple years experience but someone with really good mid-level experience that you can throw in and and you know after a little bit of on-ramp time yeah um, can just be a fully functioning the, the answer to this question may be obvious but what was the impetus behind this program I think we were very concerned about our ability to retain and promote women, and this was certainly a way to to work at that on getting the um, the cohort bigger. Um, and uh, you know, it's such an untapped resource, at least in, in, in the legal profession, because if you step out, it's very hard to convince people to come back in because people start thinking about your billing rate and your experience and matching those up and what if you can sell those skills at that rate to the client. The firm also has a very active mentoring sponsorship program. Talk a little bit about what each of those things are and what they mean and how at Pillsbury you guys are active in that space. Sure, well we do, all, uh, well, as, as, you know, I'll, I'll talk as it fits in with the on-ramp program. So we do both um, some programs where it's just sort of cult, general, general culture change and training for people. We have um, a consultant coming through each of our offices to, uh, we have, you know, we have the same problem that every other law firm does where if you look at the full equity partnership, it's 80% men, 20% women, and it's stuck there. Yeah. Um, and we really need to move the ball. And one of the things that, you know, I realize is that you know, women helping, 20% helping everyone else come up is a lot of pressure on those, that 20% to do a lot of work and it's not fair and it's not the way that we should be working either. Right. So what we're doing is identifying um, senior male partner and junior female partner pairs where the, the male partner was a sponsor a true sponsor in the sense of the word, not a mentor, but a sponsor in making sure that woman made partnership. It's someone who, actually invests in the success of that person, right. expends political capital on his or her behalf, That's right. and makes sure that they can sort of navigate. Introduces the, them to clients, gets them on the right thing, advocates so right. that they get the right kind of experience so that when they're in line for partner, everything is in place. Um, so we're identifying two to three partner pairs in each office, and she goes around and interviews them on sort of the relationship worked out, what didn't, what they learned, um, with obviously with a view to be training people in the background so that people see what's happening and how this can work. Um, and we've been getting really good feedback and really making people think about what it means to be a sponsor, identifying a sponsor both as an associate going up the ranks and understanding that you can't just collect mentors in a firm. Quickly, how long have each of the yeah. programs, the on-ramp and the mentor sponsor, were, were been going Just on? Just a couple years. Okay. Yeah. Now, Jeremy, 
Littler has a very unique sponsorship program that actually involves general counsels, including GCs that may not necessarily be clients of the firm. Talk about that a little bit. Oh, just, <laughs> I don't know if this one's on. Um, it's a little bit what Brian described, and a little bit what Deborah was describing with the LCLD Fellows Program. We've also been fortunate enough to have fellows at, at Littler as well. But we decided that wasn't enough in terms of just the volume, right? And to kind of pick up on a theme from earlier today that we heard a few times, uh, we have 71 offices now. Um, and so in many offices, a lawyer of color may be the only lawyer of color in that office. It, it, a lot of it has to do with the demographics of, of the geography. Um, so what we've done is um, we call it our champions program, I think is the protege champions and advocates are the three, the three uh, positions in this thing. And um, we take our mid-level and, and senior associates who have to be performing at a certain level, so they can't be on performance caution, essentially, and, um, and do th two things. One, we team them up with um, an advocate within the law firm, and that's usually a senior rainmaker, could be our board chair, uh, could be one of the managing two managing directors, but someone who's got some real pull within the law firm from a client perspective because look, let's face it, clients, the, the, in law firms, the books of business are what drives most metrics. Um, and then also with a champion in the, um, in the outside world or the in-house in world. <laughs> My outside world is your in-house world, I guess. <laughs> um, and so we've recruited a number of GCs or very senior assistant GCs uh, to be part of this program. They actually kind of adopt these people uh, in terms of the, the team, right? Not only the in-house uh, champions, the senior folks, but also these uh, up and coming associates. We do this with, for um, about 25 a year right now. This is our second year. As, as Joe said, many of them uh, are not our clients, although, you know, obviously we hope there's only, <laughs> there's only two kinds. There's of, like lots of cross fingers in the room. Well, you know, it doesn't hurt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but no, truly. I mean, we 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 recently, um, maybe six weeks ago, brought everybody together: champions, advocates, and sponsors, uh, and um, and the proteges. Brought them all together. Happened to be in San Diego, uh, coincidentally, uh, for two days of just kind of intense. You know, what's it like, and how to get over the hump, and is this the career path for you? I, I'm super proud to say that this year of the 25 protégés, I think 24 are up for shareholder. Now we're in the middle of that process. I don't know that we'll have 24 that make it across, but uh, I would, I'm pretty confident we're gonna have very strong numbers. And you know, once these young people really see uh, a path, as I was saying to Joe, I think this is, when you're talking about retention of anyone, but certainly lawyers of color who can be, um, feel more isolated, but even any millennial, any any lawyer coming up the chain, you really have to just figure out how to provide the experiential meaningfulness. It's really not about the money. Money matters, of course. Everybody comes out with billions of dollars of student loans now. But I think you have to show that, you know, you're doing this now as a lawyer, uh, as a practitioner, learning your craft. But you could be in a in a um, in a practice group leadership. You could be in firm leadership. You could be in knowledge management. You could be working in the innovation council, whatever whatever aspects we have. You really have to show that. Otherwise, people jump off. And, and I, I, I will say we, you know, not that it's all perfect because we've lost a lot of associates of color in the last two years, most to in-house. Now that's always a mixed blessing, mixed bag for, client, for uh, law firms, right? They're great clients. We buy them coffee, you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing, but uh, it's a challenge. Let me cite for you a research report that was done by Corporate Council of Women of Color about seven years ago. They interviewed 1,400 in-house lawyers, overwhelmingly minority, the most of them females. 76% of them started their careers at law firms. Of that number, 81% reported that they left the firm because they didn't have a quality experience. They didn't receive fair evaluations. They weren't treated with respect. They were subjected to not just implicit bias, but some cases overt bias. And I, 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 I cite that to law firms that complain about losing their talent in-house. You, you want somebody who leaves your firm 
to have had a quality experience while you were there because you never know when you may have to go hat in hand to that person for business, okay? Which brings us to the leadership role. And I'd like to ask you to talk about, because I've heard the expression, you can't be what you can't see. I want you to talk a little bit about your journey to the role that you're in now and how that took place. What are some of the challenges you had and some of the things that you learned along the way that might be instructive to people in the audience? Uh, well, I had, it, it, on the face of it, looks like a normal trajectory. But um, if you examine it a little bit more closely, it wasn't that. Um, I was working at a law firm, had a, a couple of children, and um, as all of us do, working too much. And I did not want to do that anymore. So I started looking around for an in-house position. And I deliberately took a job that I was overqualified for. So I did an off-ramp um, <laughs> and took a really easy job. And I did it because I wanted to work 9 to 5. I wanted to go home. I didn't want a nanny raising my children. Not that that's a bad thing, but that wasn't you know, right for me. And I wanted it to be easy. Um, so, so totally authentic, full disclosure. Um, and two or three years into that, something happened all on the same day. My boss retired, and another individual in the law department, it was very small, uh, decided he wanted to go to Japan. And the general counsel at that time came to me and said, you're it. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> in typical Toyota fashion, well, employment for life, right? No raise, no <laughs> bonus, no additional resources, nothing, OK? And one entire practice area I, I didn't really know that much about. So I'm like, oh, gee, my honeymoon, my personal imposed honeymoon was over. I had to get back to work. Um, and I, I went to work. And uh, the, one of the beauties of Toyota is that you can kind of invent yourself because it's fairly flat. You can do a lot. It's not as hierarchical. I mean, it's a bit hierarchical, but it's flat. So you can do this. You know, you can ladder. You've heard that kind of stuff. So I could try a bunch of different stuff. There were a lot of different things that I liked. And it um, uh, turned out, I, I guess, I was pretty good at it. However, I got to a fairly senior stage in my um, uh, career, and the GC, uh, at, so there was the GC who said, ooh, you're it, and then a new GC came in, it was hap happened to be a woman, and um, she was leaving the company and made it very, very clear to me, my whole team, the company, that there was nobody internally qualified. <laughs> we have to go outside. So in other words, I, I was a logical successor, frankly, uh, but I wasn't qualified. So here's a woman doing this. And I can remember in the moment when she made this grand announcement in a meeting thinking, okay, what the, what was that, right? <laughs> um, and how do I deal with that? And I decided at that point in time, like, okay, who, who's she to decide, right? She's leaving. Um, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, and I am the most qualified, and if they don't pick me, so what? <coughs> right? So what? I'll go find another job, something will work out. And um, so I threw my hat in the ring, and I, and I got the job. Once I had the job, I made a conscious effort, so Jeremy's point about it doesn't happen by accident, to promote and find women and women of color. I focused on women, <laughs> maybe it was because I had this experience, so um, not to say that I didn't focus on men of color too, but I was really focused on women. And I was very successful in, in recruiting, and um, up until the move, uh, three quarters of my direct reports were women and women of color. Now that the move has been announced, sadly, two of my really key women of color uh, said, hey, I can't move to Texas, and they got other positions. But I am looking for that kind of talent when I build the new group in Texas. And um, so on the, on the face of it, you know, there's always a story, right? And I would just encourage people, you know, get to know the company, right? And I've, I've said this to outside firms who've come in to try and make pitches, and they've 
they've had a slate of all white men. I'm like, oh, did you see who my direct reports were? Did you bother to look, right? Um, those kinds of things, don't assume that they don't matter. That's my advice. And, and that they really, really do. And there are people like me in these kinds of positions, Sandra being one at my sister company, we are making choices about who to, retrain, who to retain as outside counsel. We are making choices about who to hire. And, you know, make those connections. And when you have uh, people like me in, in positions like this, it, it, it will lift everybody's boat. It, it matters. I'm going to ask for questions in a moment, so prepare yourselves if you have them. But I want to be fair and, gentlemen, give the opportunity for you to talk about your career path. Brian, I already mentioned the two years you spent as general counsel at Organic Inc., which is a NASDAQ-traded company, it if was. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Not when I so, left. Not when you left. <laughs> <laughs> that was during the Internet bubble. Yeah. So a little bit about your journey to where you are now. Oh, sure. Well, I, you know, I started right out of law school at Pillsbury. Um, I was a summer associate. I went to a different law firm for my first summer to try it out, came to Pillsbury. And it was really the fact that there were, I, that I knew there were people who did the kind of work I was really interested in and um, were willing to share that work with me um, and give me the experiences I wanted that really challenged me. And I think that goes to your point. If you get really good experiences, um, it'll, it'll, it's a, a way to retain you. And I think also our chair knows that, you know, I have a lot of different interests and that's why he asked me to, to do this too. It's something I'm passionate about. And that's another sort of, as I think about it, a retention tool. Right. Jeremy? Uh, well, my, my path was uh, pretty, pretty benign. I moved from Iowa to San Diego because the weather was much better. <laughs> um, and 35 years later, I'm still there uh, a couple of days a month anyway when I'm not traveling for this job. But um, look, I think to, to some extent we have a little bit of an advantage in our, in our firm because as a single practice area, uh, labor and employment is an area that does appeal to a very diverse community of lawyers. That's just a fact. I mean, l &E is the most fun thing you can ever do other than maybe uh, divorce or criminal, and you, you're less likely to be killed in labor and employment. It's not, <laughs> it's not completely out. So, it's a, so we do have that advantage. The disadvantage we have is, to, to Brian's point, really is um, how do you build in that experiential um, ladder or, or zigzag opportunity. And if you're in a full service firm, I think there's, there may be some more of that. But um, look, I, I think to retain any talent, I mean, it, it's very tough. I said to a, a GC of a Fortune 5 company, we, we were good enough to win an award for diversity. And I went to accept the award, although well, I, my role was really to accept the award. Um, and I, and I, um, and I said to him that, you know, I had lost so many lawyers of color that year, the, the last year, associates, um, and he, that company had actually hired away four, <laughs> which is a lot when you're talking about a law firm. And so I said, next year, because you do track statistics, can I list my alum at least or do something, you know, give me some credit <laughs> here. So uh, we kind of have a laugh about that. And, and I'm not sure that's, that's going to uh, help me win an award again, but um, it's just very difficult, and I really think it's about two things. It's about the experience, particularly when you're talking about law firms. It's about the experience, and it's about the clients. Uh, if you have exposure to the clients, if you have control over the work, the, you know, to, the impact, um, kind of the Walmart model is the, is the big carrot, right? Um, then, then, I, then you will be satisfied in your career. But it's a very tough business. It's a very, very difficult business right now. And we're very responsive to the demands of our clients with respect to diversity. So when, when, when you ask and when you point out, it, it resonates. Yeah, and our research shows that an increasing number of clients are being more active about asking and insisting and actually checking in in the various ways that companies can with their firms about what they're doing around diversity and inclusion. And I think that was to my benefit. One of our, one of our clients is Chevron, and Chevron really tracks who's working on it, how many hours, are you being promoted, do we see you, are you getting credit for it? And that really helped in my career. That's right. So did, did I have any questions yet? Yes, uh, several. Uh, see, we traded the hand mic for that mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was uh, wondering to Jeremy, what, why in the last couple of years 
have you had this problem with retention of what it sounds like senior associates? You, the program you described sounds like best practices. Uh, you know, so moving from uh, mentorship to sponsorship, not just having you know a simple sponsorship relationship, but having outside, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. what, what have you, you know, if, if best practices are, are, are being tripped up even? I will say this, and, and uh, those of you who are in-house can be prepared to throw stones or tomatoes or whatever you have at your disposal. I do think there is a culture in the in-house world of, I call it the outsourcing of diversity. You know, if you work with very talented associates, and particularly associates of, of color or GLBT or women or something that's on the diversity piece, it's very attractive for companies to go after that talent to bring it in-house. I mean, there is a movement generally, as you know, uh, whichever side of this business you're in, that um, right now companies are bringing work in-house. I mean, that's just, a, that's just the reality of it. And, you know, heaven help us once Watson gets a hold of all of us. But right now the companies are bringing the work in-house. And so um, I, I really don't think it's a, a, it's not that we're not doing the right things. And I think, frankly, our challenges right now are more pipeline than retention. But I do think you do see in-house, you see companies hiring away. I mean, they're hiring great talent for me. And, you know, how do you say, don't do that? And by the way, could you pay your invoice for this month? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you asked for the invoice first. Uh, okay, I think, Sonia, did you have a question? My question is to all of you. You all have programs in place. And um, what I wanted to find out is what has not worked or what have you learned from those programs? I don't know how long they've been in place. I know, Jeremy, you have the on-ramp and you have the Littler program and then... Catherine, you have your secondment that Toyota uses. What um, what challenges or what hasn't really worked or what you've learned? That was going to be my stump the panel question, Sonia. So thank you. No, <laughs> that, that's, no, that, really that's actually a great question. I won't say what hasn't worked exactly because I'm a lawyer. So why would I answer the question? But um, I, I would say this: we one thing we have consciously not done, and I know a lot of firms have done, and and we look at it um, is kind of designate a diversity chair, diversity inclusion czar. I'll call it. Uh, we haven't done that. We've been pretty conscious in not doing that because we, right now, I think we have a highly functioning diversity and inclusion council. It's open to anyone who wants to join it. Is uh, there someone who chairs the council or no? You know, they, they set the agenda for the meetings, but no. Yeah. And, and, and um, it does work. You have to, you know, uh, as with anything in bringing groups together and somebody mentioned relationships, this, obviously we're in a business that's a relationship. You have to spend the money to bring people together physically when you're spread around five time zones. It's particularly acute. No, you, I, I mean, I, I can and speak it's something from we're looking experience. at. I don't know if a czar is a good idea or not a good idea. Yeah. No, I, I can speak from personal experience about Littler. I mean, you guys, a lot, first of all, I appreciate and kudos to each of your organizations for your support of organizations like MCCA, uh, like NAMWOLF. I know you're very active with NAMWOLF, particularly uh, Toyota, LCLD, you mentioned that, even CMCP. Right. And by the way, Robert, congratulations on joining, uh, following the, in the footsteps of the great Marcy Rubin. I know you'll do well. Um, but you know, I've seen like Natalie Pierce from your firm, Jeff Jones from Orlando. I mean, you guys are like everywhere. So kudos with that. Uh, kind of an adjunct to Sonia's question, if, and we're hoping that people will plagiarize, okay? That's the goal of this yeah. panel. Pick of the great programs that you do, one or two, that you really, really like, that you'd like to say, take this and, and do it in your own shops. Sure, do you want me to? Sure. Um, so we have a board task force on the advancement of women, specifically on the advancement of women. There are two very senior partners, one of whom is the general counsel of the firm, who every year circulate through the firm meeting with different uh, groups. The first year they met with the practice sections, those are the P&Ls that we have, those are the P&L lines, so they're the ones that are actually making the promotions. Going through, sitting down with all of the leaders in every practice section one by one saying, here are the women in your group, Here's how many hours they're billing. Are they getting the kind of experience they need to get to partner? Where do you see them, and how are they moving along? And I, within two years, we had, I think that the second year after that, we had a 50% female class uh, across the firm. 
um, and it's been going up and down. But we're, you know, now they're moving into different areas of of the the firm. Of the last the the ones we did this year, we're also organizing client teams, meeting with all the client team leaders, saying, "Where are the women on your teams? Do you know what your client looks like? Are you presenting women?" and putting them in positions where they actually can take on responsibility. That's great, and, and at that level of granularity is sometimes yes. the difference between a program Ex that works and exactly. one that doesn't. Exactly, not just talking about it, but looking at the numbers. Right, yeah. Jeremy? We started our, uh, and it's not unique to our law firm, of course, but we started our affinity groups, uh, and we have four, um, Asian uh, Pacific Islander, uh, lawyers, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, uh, LGBTQ, uh, and um, and African American. Yeah, black people. Uh, no, we do. No, of course, I know there are black lawyers at Littler. <laughs> I can attest to this fact. I I won't talk about our panel diversity uh, today. So, <laughs> but um, those affinity groups started as kind of you know I won't call it a chat room, but just a, a really an email chain. Then we decided as a law firm uh, several years ago, look, let's put some real money into this and, and put some real resources into it. So they, they get together uh, every other year, they're on a every other year cycle, uh, pick their agenda, pick their speakers, obviously with the financial support of the law firm. Uh, we bring in the certainly the managing directors. We want to hear what the, the mood is. It's not all work. It's a lot of fun stuff too. Um, they pick the locations. It's It's been a very, um, you know, if you are a, a person of one in your office, we don't think of, I don't see it that way, right? Because I get to visit 70 offices, but I'm not living in that office every day. And it's really done a, a tremendous job in terms of retaining our lawyers uh, to know that there's somebody they can connect with. And this is from the you know most senior uh, you know 40 year practitioners, uh, some of the folks we described we talked about earlier, uh, Ron to to first years coming in. So they really get a lot out of it. And um, I don't think he's here right now. The fellow from Munger Tolls said, you know, when you go to a meeting the first time, you don't you're kind of shy. But when you go to a meeting with a lot of people that you kind of can connect with, you're not that shy. It's really helped a, a great deal. We just had ours, and it really raises the energy level. Yeah. yeah. And when you go to a meeting with alcohol, you're just really not shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm from New Orleans originally. <laughs> Catherine. Um, I, the program that I'm the most proud of is a partnership that we've developed with both UCLA and USC. And they have programs where they take talented um, mostly minority students, and they give them scholarships, and they promise them employment during the summers. And my point earlier about, you know, most people don't come in-house directly uh, is true. So what we've done is we've partnered with a, a law firm, and students can come in and basically split the summer. And half of the summer is with a law firm, half the summer is with us. So they get kind of that in-house exposure. And um, that has been really, it's just really fun, number one, because they're young and they're still excited to be a lawyer. And um, they get a very <laughs> different experience being in-house. You know, um, in the firm, it's, you know, all about the the you know, the product and all of that. We have that too, but we want them to understand the culture, what it really means to be an in-house person. So to your question about what hasn't worked, it hasn't, things that don't, it, when I've seen it not work, it's when somebody doesn't get the culture or we haven't connected the culture enough with the person. And then the person self-selects. It hasn't happened very much. We've only had a couple, but, um, and, and they weren't necessarily even people of color or women. But when, when people come in and they don't get that culture, it, it's a problem because then they don't feel comfortable. Um, any other questions? We are just about out of time, but I wanted to give one more opportunity. Yes. It's a great question. Not everybody's a true believer, people. So 
Who wants to handle that? I have the easiest job in America because every day I wake up with 1,100 helpers telling me how to do my job a little bit better. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, it would be a wonderful world if, like you said, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here either if everybody agreed with me and just did what I said. It would be a lot easier, I promise. Um, you know, I think a couple of things. One is, uh, to Liz's point earlier, you, there are uh, to the earlier panel, there are some people that, particularly when you're talking about partners, and I have 400 plus, that uh, will do things just because, you know, that's their belief. They are true believers, as Joe said. And there are other people who really just need to hear the business value proposition. I had one lawyer who's, uh, you know, I'm sure his heart was in the right place, but we heard a general counsel say, uh, 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 an African-American general counsel who we know quite well, he worked at Littler years ago, who said, I have 4 million customers a year, 2 million are not white. So if you don't think that that matters to me as a business proposition, forgetting to you know, set everything aside, and uh, you, you could see the light bulb go off. So you know, change happens very slowly in law firms. We joke about some law firms change one funeral at a time. They, it changes very slowly in law firms, and you just, you just have to keep pushing. You, do, think, you have okay. to have the message. I, I think, and I think having the clients bring it up front and center is, is really where you push the people who aren't truly bought in. I think we're, we're really lucky at Pillsbury to have a very good corporate culture and a really good tone at the top. So very little pushback. So my, my good friend Tom Sager, who is a recently retired general counsel at DuPont, who's just a transformative figure, generally in the legal profession, but especially on diversity and inclusion. He, I was talking to him a few weeks ago and he said, he said Joe, look, about 10 years ago, there were three Fortune 500s that had the position of chief diversity officer. He said today, two thirds of the Fortune 500 have a chief diversity officer position and companies don't create positions at that level because it's the flavor of the month or because it's a passing fancy. So I, I really think that anybody who thinks that diversity isn't important now and won't continue to be important, particularly as demographic changes continue mm -hmm. to occur, they're living in a fantasy world. And I think they will, they will find themselves in for a rude awakening. So um, thank you all. Let's thank the panel. <laughs> <laughs>